Well, today is the double whammy. It's spring break, time change Sunday, and I see a few people missing in this room, but I also see some people in this room who are supposed to be in second service, but when you came, it had already happened, and here you are. At least you stayed, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you did. Well, we changed the clocks yesterday, and now it's going to be light later, and this is the part of the year I just absolutely love. And I appreciate you being here today. I want to talk to you about uh, this subject that we've been going through now. This is 10 weeks on uh, the book of Proverbs, and this is the last of, of the series. I don't know, have you heard of those, those novels that are sort of you choose your own adventure kind of novels? Have you ever heard of these? In which uh, they start telling the story, and then you get to choose which direction the story is going to go. I've never gotten one of these, but they, they really sound interesting to me. And there's one guy who explained it. He, he sort of gave me a story to explain what, what it's about. He said, I want you to imagine that you are being chased by rabid wolverines, and they're coming after you. And now you're running. You're trying to get away from these wolverines, these wolves. And, and, and as you are, all of a sudden, oh, on the left-hand side, there is a hidden cave, and you just saw it. And do you go into the cave? And if you do, turn to page 210. But if you don't, if you keep running, turn to page 130. And I was thinking... No, you don't go into that cave because these wolves, they've got a great sense of smell. They'll just follow you right into those caves, into that cave, and you don't have any flashlight. And they'll get in there, and they can see better than you, and, man, they will really get you in the cave. No, you've got to keep running. You've got to find a tree somewhere. But I think I was getting into it a little bit more than he intended. So he said, no, what you do, you choose, oh, you choose go into the cave. So you go into the cave. Page 210, and you're reading along and reading along. You're feeling you don't have a fast flashlight. You're trying to feel your way through this cave. It's all dark. And all of a sudden, on page 230, you discover this is not a cave after all. This is a shoot from a volcano. And you've gone one step too far in the dark, and you have fallen 500 feet right into the lava. You hit the lava or lava or however you want. You hit that, it ain't going to turn out well, right? He says, see, if only you would have known in advance. And I thought to myself, how much real life is that like? We face these decisions and we've got to make a call and we don't know how the future is going to turn out. We don't know what it's going to be like on the other page and we just have to make the call and here we are. Oh, no. If only we would have known in advance. So many of our decisions are just that way. We don't know what's coming. I mean, who one year ago could have predicted the price of oil today? You don't know what's coming. You make your best call. You do your best. You're you're wise. You're smart. You do your very best. And when you do your best in making a decision, you don't know what's coming. And maybe it doesn't work out as well as you'd hope. You just keep praying. You keep scratching and clawing. You keep going. You don't quit. You did your best. But there are some things in our lives when we're faced with a decision, we know the outcome before it happens. That's what the book of Proverbs is about. There's some things we can know what will happen. And Solomon wrote the book so that we would. He wrote the book of Proverbs as a gift to his children. And he said to them, I've lived already a long life. I, I've gained wisdom from God. I've gained wisdom from experience. And I want to pass this along to you. I want to say, say to you, there's some potholes. I want to show you where they are. I want to show you the mistakes. I want to show you how you can keep from going that way. And I'm going to write this book to give you wisdom because we can be wise beyond our years. We can be wise beyond our years. And so we've walked through now 10 weeks of the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs, and wow, we've, we have learned things. We, we have seen things, and, and in fact, he's really been 
very stark in showing us, let me tell you where you're headed with this. You go this route. Let me tell you what's going to end up happening. And we could go another 10 weeks. We could go another 20 weeks. There's so many topics, it's unbelievable. But the great thing about the series is you are already into Proverbs. You, all along, over 1,200 people have been reading the book of Proverbs, the chapter that corresponds with the date of the month. And many of you have read it over twice, and you could keep reading. And you could go the end of this calendar year and next year and this next decade. Seriously, there are people that do this for decades. And what happens is you're building layers after layers after layers of wisdom. And every day you're picking some verse that says, okay, God, this is an area of wisdom I want to grow in. This is, this is important for me today. And if you do, what will happen is as you're living life and you're experiencing one of these issues of life, these areas of life, all of a sudden, poof, all up will come this word of wisdom from God's word from Proverbs. Oh, no, I know I should not go that way. And you will spare yourself so many troubles. Today, what I want to do then is come to the end of the series, and I want to do something that's very different for me and is way abnormal the way I want to approach it. So I'm asking for grace today, a little bit of grace as we go along. There's two things that I want to do. I want to, I want to share with you a life-changing idea and I want to share with you a life-changing verse as we pull it all together. The life-changing idea is this, that all of life is about a path. I've mentioned this a couple of times along the way. All of life is about a path. I'd like to, to talk to the younger ones first, if I could, and that's younger, I mean, all the way maybe older middle school to high school to college to 20s. Sort of that, that zone. Could I just talk to you for a moment first? Uh, if everything plays out, I mean, we, none of us know we have another day. People die at every age. But if everything plays out the way we think, more than likely you're at the front end and you've got a long time to go and it's just fantastic. And what you're going to begin discovering, especially older middle school and into high school, is that you're now in situations in which your parents don't know what's going on in your life. They don't know the decisions you're making. They don't know what's exactly happening. And that keeps growing the older you get. Now you're in college, and especially if you go to college maybe away, and they don't know anything that's going on except what you tell them. And, and you're just going to tell them what you want to tell them. And so... You are in a unique situation because now, the older you get, you just do what you want. And you are finding yourself now in situations in which you've been walking down this path with your parents as you're growing up, and now you're making some decisions, and you're going to face this great temptation. And the great temptation is related to alcohol and sex and, and uh, drugs. And everybody does in, in the, that zone. And you're, you're going to make some decisions now. In your mind, you're thinking, well, this is an event. This moment is just an event. But actually, Solomon says, no, actually, this is beginning a path. And you don't realize it. It's not an event. It's beginning a path. And you say, well, everybody's doing this, and you ought to explore, and, you know, who cares? But what happens is in this zone that there are great kids who, who have such great potential and, 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 and really their lives, it's just amazing what could happen. And in this zone, they begin to derail. They begin to leave the path of their parents. They're thinking, they're not thinking they are, but they actually are leaving the path. They're derailing, and some find themselves in decisions that they make that they thought were events, but it's actually a different path that has a different ending, and they end up getting damaged, some just a little bit, some a decade or two decades, and some never, ever get back on the path. And I'm saying this because this is, this is what every person in that zone 
faces in their life all through this zone. And here's what Solomon says in the first seven chapters. You just read it at, in through the eyes of that age bracket, and you, it will be startling. What Solomon is saying is this is a path, not an event. This is setting a course in your life, and the damage is immense, though you don't realize it. The key to our lives is getting on and staying on the right path. And if we do, we will live our best life. And all of Proverbs is about rescuing us from the downsides of wrong decisions that are off the path. There's so many exits off the path. And so I want to think about this idea for just a few moments because I think it's critical. Listen to what he says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 10. Listen, my son. See, he's, he's talking to his kids. Listen, my son, accept what I say. The years of your life will be many. If you listen to what I'm telling you, you're, you're, the years of your life will be many. It's not, a, it's not an absolute promise. People die at, at, young, at young ages too. But he's saying that you will avoid things that would take your life prematurely. You're going to be blessed. I will guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. And when you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Don't let it go. Guard it well, for it's your life. It's more than you realize. Don't set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn from it. Go your way, the way, the path of the righteous. It's like the first gleam of dawn shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't even know what makes them stumble. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. And only take ways that are fun. What I did, I, I, I just picked a short passage of Scripture, and I made sure you noticed all the times he says path and way, and there are eight of them in this little passage. And he's making a point to his children. He is saying life is a path. And the key is getting on the right path and staying on the right path. And we've been in the process of work, working through that. We, we talked about how you, you and I can have a balanced soul. Our soul is in who we are inside, our mind, will, and emotions, and how we can live a balanced soul. So many people are trying to find balance and can't find it. But he showed us how we could be balanced in our soul. He showed us how that we could develop this time management, how we could have better friendships, how we could overcome pride, how we could get control of our tongue, how we could overcome anger, how we could build respect from other people toward us. All these things we've looked at. We didn't look at money management, though he deals with a lot with money management, but I just dealt with money management about, uh, about two years ago, and I'd advise you if this is an area that you'd like to learn more about, go back on the website, go through the whole series. It's going to rescue you, I promise you. It just takes Proverbs and many of the other passages, but the Bible says a great deal about money management and, and how to be happy and how to have better health. There's so many topics, and all of it is this. That direction, not good intentions, equals destination. That equation is very simple, and it's Andy, Andy Stanley, the best I know, that articulated that. It's not me, it's Andy Stanley, and I took that idea. And here is the concept. It's the actual decisions we make, not our intentions. We got great intentions, but somehow we make other decisions. It's the actual decisions we make that determines our destiny, not our intentions. All of life is connected. The decisions we choose right now will determine what happens a year from now and 10 years from now. 
life is connected through a principle God built into the universe called cause and effect. I want to give you some examples. All my ministry, um, I've had youth pastors who've said these kinds of things to me. You know, we we had these families, and from the time their kids were little, they're in Sunday school, and they go to Bible fellowship, and they are training, getting involved with the kids. And then there's something that happens to some parents when their children move into the teenage years. The most amazing thing, we're not going to church now. We're going to go to the lake, we're going to do sports, we're going to do something else, we're going to spend most, not all of our, but most, many of our Sundays somewhere else. And every so often we're going to pop in church. It's not like we're going to avoid church entirely. We're going to come in when there's nothing else in the way. But the whole idea of this is the most important point of my kid's life so that I want this, my child, my teenager to be discipled. I'm going to be uh, the disciple of the church is going to come along and help me, and this is important, and I want my, my teenager to learn how to serve other people. I want my teenager to be around godly influences, and that's all fine and good, but right now our focus is on something else. For some reason, we've gotten off a track, and we're not going to be in church as much. We're, we're going to do other things, and what happens is that these very parents are actually the ones that leave the path. They don't think they are, but they do, and their kids just simply keep going. And the parents have so devalued spiritual things that their children begin to live out that devaluation. The parents get in a panic. There's two different scenarios. One scenario is parents just pour all themselves into their kids and they're training them and discipling them, do their very best. Their kids grow up, and most of the time the kids just keep on going in the right way. But every so often, here's this parent done the great job, done everything they could, and the child gets up to maybe college or beyond, and they're, they're making their own decisions. And of all things, they go off the path. And they start going down the wrong road. And the, the, this parent said, I, after all this, I've shown you and I've lived it out. I've shown you with my life. And there they go off the path. And their parents' are, hearts are broken. But there's a second scenario. And this second one is what I'm talking about, where the parent begins to leave the path. And for some reason, it's during this teenage years. I don't know. And now those kids just keep going away from God. And when the parents wake up and see what has happened, they, they get all upset. And I've had many of them come to my office, I, I, and they blame God. What has God done? Why didn't God stop my kids? And Solomon says, wait a minute. You and I are the ones who choose a path. And now this is the result because life is connected, and the decisions we make now impact tomorrow in the next 10 years and 20 years. So don't blame God. Here's a second illustration. A person, instead of developing and sticking to a budget and living out the financial principles of Solomon in the book of Proverbs and other places in God's Word, chooses the easier path of least resistance and spends and spends and spends and spends and borrows and borrows and borrows and borrows and and all the time thinking, you know, Everything's going to come out okay because it's God's job to fix my messes. And so God's going to make everything right. And when the creditors come knocking, you know, God will bail me out because that's God. But then God doesn't bail them out. And they begin to blame God. And Solomon says, wait a minute, you chose the path. And now this is the result. Don't blame God. Or here's another one. You intend to marry a godly man and have a godly family. You want God to be at the core of your life. You want your kids to, to know the Lord. You want your husband and you to be, you want a great godly family, but you're dating a guy who doesn't even know God. He's not even interested. 
but he's so cute, and he's got such a great personality, and everybody says we just are a fit, and I see all my friends, they're all getting married, and you know what? I, I'll change him, and I'll tell him how important this is to me, and he'll start coming to church with me, and maybe he even does for a little while, and, and uh, I'll, I'll explain this is so important, and then when we get married, well, what happens is in a couple of months, he just begins to revert. Because it's the decisions we make, not the intentions, the good intentions we have, that determines our destiny. You intend to have a great marriage, but look how you're treating your husband. Look how you're treating your wife. And there's bitterness building. And you know it's there. It's in you. It's in your spouse. And it's all headed toward a volcano. And somehow you're not changing. And it's the same kinds of decisions. And it's determining your destiny. And men, your intention is for your kids to grow up and feel close to you and to love you and want to be around you. But you're working 70 or 80 hours a week and you're never home. And now they're entering into teenage years. And this is the hardest time. This is the time they need you more than ever. They need you now. And you're still working 70 or 80 hours a week because you're trying to build a career. You're trying to, to pay for the stuff. And, and besides that, you, you really want to rise. You've got this in your heart. And, and you want to have as big a house as oh, so-and-so has and stay up with so-and-so. And your kids are growing up without you. And all of these intentions you have are going to go up in smoke. You're not there. Or you want your kids to respect you. You want them to get married and have kids and bring the grandkids home. And you want them to ask you for advice. And But you're cheating on their mother. And maybe they know and maybe they don't yet. But they will. And they're never going to forget that. What I'm saying is, is that it's not good intentions that gets us anywhere. It's decisions that determines our direction. That responding to the truths of the book of Proverbs through the lens of life is connected and life is a path and we are responsible for our decisions will actually change the rest of your life. We can't keep eating what we're eating and spending what we're spending, and doing what we're doing, and expect a different result. It won't happen. We're setting our destiny with every decision that we make. This is the big idea of Proverbs. I don't want us to leave the book without coming back to this idea and nailing it in our hearts and minds. Because this was what Proverbs was about. There's a life-changing idea. Life's a path. Second of all, there's a life-changing verse. Proverbs 27, 12. Proverbs 27, 12. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. I've read this verse like a a hundred times, and I've read over it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, and I just keep going, but it smacked me in the face. Solomon is saying there's two kinds of people. There are the wise, and there are the simple. The wise is just a Solomon word for, or, or, or prudent, is just a Solomon word for wise, and Simple is just a Solomon word for naive. And none of us would think we were naive. Well, you're not talking about me. And here is what he's saying. He's saying the wise 
and the simple both see the same danger, but they respond totally differently and have total different outcomes. The wise see danger and take refuge. The wise have their eyes and their brains open and they're watching, they're looking. And as they are, they see danger. And they say, that is danger and I am headed for cover. And they are protected. But the simple are the naive and they live as, they wouldn't say this, but they live as life is not connected. That if I do this today, I won't suffer that tomorrow. They act like it's not connected. There's danger. Yeah, I see it. And it is a problem for some people. I mean, I hear all the stories, but it won't be for me because somehow, I mean, I'm superman, superwoman, and I, somehow it won't affect me, though it'll affect others. And I guarantee you, it'll affect them, but it will not. It will not affect me. The primary difference between the wise and the naive is not what they see, but how they respond to what they see. So, the prudent, the wise, see danger and they what? They seek refuge. And the naive see danger and they what? They just keep going. When the prudent identify behaviors that are turning into habits that will end up controlling them, they stop when they can. They stop while they can. They won't keep going. They know where this habit's going. But when the simple gets involved with with activities that are beginning to turn into habits, they say, hey, I can always stop. And they keep right on going. When the prudent sense a relationship moving into an unhealthy position, an unhealthy direction, maybe it's somebody at work, and, you know, at first it was just, it was just innocent flirtation, didn't mean anything, but as the days go by, you're around that person. It seems like the person's always happy. They're always doing good, and your spouse isn't always happy, and things aren't as good. And what happens is, is that there's this little pitter-patter that begins to happen in your heart, and, you, you, and you're starting to feel it. It's actually beginning to happen, and maybe it's happening to the other person too. And you realize there's danger, and the wise say, no. There's danger in that direction. I'll seek refuge. I am not continuing in this direction. This will damage. I'm not going to do it. But the naive keep going and saying, you know, what's the harm? Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe someone at school. Maybe it is a neighbor. When the prudent see trouble on their financial horizon, they stop. I see trouble. I got to stop this. I got to stop the spending. I got to get my, my act together. But the naive keep going and they say, well, even after all, didn't Jesus say, uh, why worry about tomorrow? So why worry? But when Jesus said that, it was an entirely different context than this. And then the proverb closes with a specific prediction. It's a warning, and notice what he says. Proverbs 27, 12, the prudent see danger and what? Take refuge. And the naive see danger and keep going and suffer. And suffer for it. And suffer suffer. And here's what Solomon is saying. If you keep going in this direction that you already know is not wise, if you keep going in this direction, you will suffer. Will it be immediate? Not necessarily. Sometimes it is immediate, but sometimes you oh, you, you go the wrong way, you already know it's wrong, and you already know there's danger, and 
You do it and no consequences. Look at me. Damn, it's so strong. Do it again, no consequences. Yeah. Do it again, no consequences. And I knew the preacher was wrong. I knew Mark Hartman did not know what he's talking about. See, this is evidence. No consequences. And then all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere, what happened here, the consequences start coming and coming and coming, and they won't quit. They just keep pouring on, and you can't make it stop. There's so many examples of this, but there's an example in the news right now, and I don't mean to pile on at all. This guy, he's a person, but I'm thinking of Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football, and, and all the stories in, in college and the wild lifestyle, and boy, there's no consequences. Man, that guy just out there, he could make it happen, and just on and on and on, and there's just no consequences, but now there's no end to him, and he's lost control of the consequences, and he can't stop it. And our heart goes out to him. He's a person. Our heart goes out to his parents, to his people. Their, their hearts are broken. But there's no stopping. And all of us in this room know that he is losing, already losing things he can't ever get back. Because you can't break what Solomon said. The naive see danger and keep going and suffer. Suffer for it. And so here's my question. What's the danger in front of you? What is this thing that God keeps telling you? This is wrong. Don't keep doing this. This is wrong. Stop this. The wise see danger and take refuge. But the naive see danger and keep going and suffer. God is speaking to us today, and he says, here's the big idea of Proverbs. Life's connected. It's a path. Suffering is coming. If you don't stop proceeding toward the danger, and there it is.